And this morning I'm going to do something a little bit different. I thought last week was neat. I thought last week was different. Uh, the Lord, I, I think God speaks to us in different ways. And, and I will tell you this morning that I'm going to have a very, very, very short service, uh, probably the shortest message I've ever preached. And, um, and just for those of you that are wondering, that is your first April Fool's joke of the day. I thought you might appreciate that <laughs> for our visitors. The preacher at this church can be long-winded at times. I don't know what he's going to do today, but he can be long-winded, so maybe we can rush him up this morning. But I want to do something a little bit different. Uh, the Lord has given me kind of this image, and I brought it out in a message over the last few weeks, and, and I can see this. God, uh, God has to speak to me in a visual way. I'm a visual thinker. I don't know if you're a visual thinker. I'm a visual thinker. So when you describe something to me, I visualize it. So when you describe a fishing trip to me, I'm visualizing. I can see the water. I can see the bank. I can see the trees. I can see your rod come over when he bites and, and, and all I can just visualize it. The other night I'm on the phone with, with Dan and, and me and JL have been fishing and didn't catch a single thing. And I'm on the phone with Dan that night and he's got a crew he's taken out and, and he's just talking away. You know, I can hear the motor running in the background all of a sudden, get him, get him, get him. <laughs> I had to repent for a moment. <laughs> I can visualize it. When he said that, I saw this guy pull a bow back, the arrow leave the bow, go into the fish and begin to reel him in. I mean, I was visualizing this because I'm a visual thinker, which by the way, if you have surgery or some gross thing and you'd go to tell me, I'm a visual thinker. I have just imagined everything you described in vivid detail. So you don't have to go into that detail unless you just really fill of the Lord too and I'm not kidding so I'm a visual thinker I believe that God speaks to us the way that we listen and I, I, I seem to understand things more uh, visually and so this over the last few weeks I have seen this scenario play out because I like looking at scripture and seeing what it's actually like you know you, where you can see that image of, of uh, this is one thing I love about Christian movies I'm anxious to go see Paul I know that uh, I can only imagine has done fantastic in the theaters I'm anxious to see Paul because you're seeing scripture played out right in front of you I think that's amazing because I love to visualize this well I have had a courtroom setting so let me give you a couple verses and you can go ahead and turn to Zechariah chapter 3 I'm going to give you a couple of verses uh, as you do that. Isaiah chapter 3, verses 13 through 14 says, God enters the courtroom. He takes his place at the bench to judge his people. God calls for order to the court, hauls the leaders of his people into the docket. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, it says, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one of us may receive what is due for what he has done in this body, whether good or evil. The Passion Translation says, For one day we will all be openly revealed before Christ on his throne, so that each of us will duly be recompensed for our actions done in life, whether good or worthless. So here's the reality. There is going to come a point, there's going to come a day that you and I both are going to come before Christ and answer for everything we have said or done. Amen? This is the judgment of God. The word judgment, we think of that as a bad sense. We always hear that word judgment and we, our mind immediately goes to God just tearing something apart. That's not what judgment means. Judgment means a verdict to be rendered, the, the innocent to be vindicated, and the guilty to be punished. See, so the word judgment in and of itself is a very benign word. It doesn't have a negative connotation. It just means there's a verdict released. So we're going to come to a point where God judges. So throughout scripture, we have this scenario of a courtroom. And, and this, is, this is really the image that I've been having. So Zechariah chapter 3. I love this story. I love the imagery that it gives. Starting in verse 1, it says, Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you. 
The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is it not this brand plucked from fire? Now Joshua was standing before the angel, clothed in filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, Behold, I have taken away your iniquity. And I will clothe you, clothe you in pure vestments. And I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with the garments. And the angel of the Lord was standing by. So we have this courtroom setting. We have Joshua who had filthy garments. The word filthy there means sinful or actually uh, uh, in lack. It can mean either one. So for all intent and purposes, we know that, that Joshua, the high priest, was in fact a man. And we are all sinners saved by grace, right? In the new covenant, we are all fallen short of the glory of God. So he was a sinful man. And Satan is the prosecutor. The word Satan is Hasatan, and it is actually not a name. It is a title, and it means the accuser, or by implication, a prosecutor. Ain't that interesting? So Satan is the prosecutor, and he's accusing Joshua, the high priest. God is the mighty judge, and he says, shut up, Satan. That's my version. He says, the Lord rebuke you. There is no higher rebuke than from God himself. So the way I hear that is Satan is just, man, 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 man. You ever been around somebody with too much energy? I'll give my son an energy drink and let you, let you see a, a visual demonstration. <laughs> so he's just nagging, just wow, wow, wow. And the Lord stops and says, shut up. Silence hits. And he looks at Joshua and he says, son, your, 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 your clothes are filthy. And he looks at the angels. He says, get these filthy rags off of my servant and give him clean rags. How awesome is that? So I want this to be the foundation or the image as, as we go this morning, because I want to present to you a, a, um, a skit, a verbal skit. How about that? I'm going to lay it out in such a way that I hope that, that it invokes uh, the, the visualization in yourself to see this play out in our own lives. First um, John 2.1 says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Romans 8 34 says Christ Jesus is at the right hand of God interceding for us so in the in this example or this scenario in Zechariah we have God the father as the judge right and we have Hasatan as the prosecutor and we have Joshua the high priest as the guilty in need of defending but there's no defense attorney there's no one to defend him so God steps in and redeems him. Guess what? God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He shows just as much mercy and grace in the Old Testament as he does in the New Testament because his character never changed. The difference is in the New Testament, we have an advocate. We have a, a defense. We have a sacrifice for you and for me that we did not have in the Old Covenant. The old covenant was depending on you or me to live up to a standard that made us measure up to the covenant of which we can't measure up to. Under the new covenant, we have this sinless, perfect one who gave his life for us. And he is our advocate. The word advocate actually means parakletos. It means helper. It means comforter. By implication, defense attorney. This is pretty amazing to me. I've had this image in my head for a couple of weeks and, and I've really uh, personally been able to pray this because I can see this because we come before the courts of the Lord and I can see this, uh, uh, how this works and it's just amazing to me. And last night I've, I've already had this uh, message being prepared all week and last night I did a quick search just out of curiosity because, you know, sometimes we think we are um, so brilliant <laughs> That we come up with the revelation the first time. <laughs> so I just did a quick search just to see if anybody else was as brilliant as I was. And come to find out there are quite a few. <laughs> you know, it's great when you're the smartest one in the room. <laughs> but it helps if there's somebody else in the room with you. <laughs> Think on that one for a minute. 
I told somebody one time, I said, if you're always the smartest one in the room, you need to change rooms, baby. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to leave that alone. So I did this search, and I found this really neat article. And it was this guy uh, explaining through, through the definitions, just like I just did, just like I've had all week, how, how Satan is the prosecutor and Jesus is the defense attorney. And I was thinking, wow, this is amazing. And this is a great article. And then at the end of it, he said, this is why I chose to become a defense attorney. And I was like, hmm. It was kind of an a, a epiphany for me because we think of defense attorneys as, well, not in a good light. <laughs> It was amazing. That was, that was where he received his call into law was to defend the defenseless. That's amazing. To defend the defenseless. Sometimes we look and we say, but they're defending somebody who's guilty. Keep that in mind. Jesus defends who is guilty. That's pretty amazing. So let me, let me play this out for you. First off, let's, Let's get some of the setting. So we have ha satan, or in the Greek is diablos, means the same thing. It means accuser. It means prosecutor. We can see this scenario, how he plays it out in Zechariah 3. We can also see this in Job. Uh, uh, Satan comes before uh, God in, in the book of Job, and, and he's looking for someone to accuse. And God says, have you considered my uh, servant Job? He's so righteous. And Satan says to God, because you have put a hedge of protection around him and because you have blessed him, but if you allow me to touch him, he will curse you. Let me give you the modern translation according to me with that. He says, yeah, because you've given him everything he wants, but if you let me get to him, I'll turn him. That's what he says. He says, I will turn him the moment your blessings are not readily available to him. He'll flip on you. So God says, go ahead. See, this is the scenario. Not only is he a prosecutor, but he's dirty. He uses entrapment. Entrapment is against our natural law, our laws of the land. Entrapment is, is against the law. And if a prosecutor uses entrapment to ensnare somebody, then the case will be thrown out. And they can actually prosecute the prosecutor for malicious prosecution. That was neat, wasn't it? No, I'm not a lawyer, but I watched one on TV. So we, we have Satan, this is his job, is to accuse. You know what he uses? Now, I, let, me, let me base this on this. Our, our law of the land is actually scripturally based. Now, the way we have it divided is, is based to a large degree from the Roman system of the Senate and so forth. But our law is based in Scripture. No matter who tries to rewrite history, no matter who tells you that we're not a Christian nation and all that kind of junk, we were founded as a Christian nation on the Word of God and we got our legal system right here from the law. So... Satan has been using these tactics the same way we see them played out in the natural. He uses doubt. He uses doubt. If Satan can cause you to doubt the promise of God on your life, then you'll forfeit the promise because you don't believe. If Satan can cause you to doubt what you believe, then literally the foundation of your faith begins to deteriorate because you have allowed the doubt to grow into deception. This is one thing I, I'm very careful not to ever uh, mention other ministers from the pulpit because uh, uh, it's, it's not right to attack other ministers unless there's ever a case that true heresy is being propagated to a generation. So with that, I will say this. There is one minister that I, I have no problem naming. His name is Rob Bell, and he wrote a book that actually questioned whether or not Jesus was truly divine, whether or not Mary was truly a virgin, whether or not Jesus was really the son of God whether he was sinless through his life and why does it matter see this is the way the enemy works if he brings doubt in to deteriorate the foundation then there's nothing to build a house on this is what the enemy does when Satan came to Eve in Genesis chapter 3 he comes up and he begins to whisper to her and he says are you sure it, did God really say that if you eat of that you're gonna die 
I have the verse. I have it somewhere. He says, he says in, in, in the first part of that, he says, did God really say that? Have you ever felt like, like God gave you this promise and then you walk out the doors and you're all excited. We had a Sunday service. You got a prophetic word and, and you come out of the service like, whoo, I am victorious. I am more than an overcomer. And then one thing goes wrong. Oh, my God. It's over. Doubt. Satan looked at Eve and he said, are you sure that's what you heard? And then two verses later, he says, surely you're not going to die. I bet what God meant was that you're going to have the knowledge of good and evil and he doesn't want you to be that powerful. I bet that's what he meant. See, the enemy comes in with doubt. This is the same thing he did to Jesus during the temptations. He, uh, Jesus comes out of the wilderness after 40 days of fasting, no food for 40 days. Some of us can't go four hours without food. I eat on average every two to two and a half hours. I eat something. <laughs> I'm like a deer. Just 40 days without eating, he comes from the wilderness and Satan comes to tempt him. And he comes to him and he says, if you're really the son of God, then look at that stone and command it to become bread. Now, Jesus knew that he had the power and authority to do this. But the question was, if you are really the son of God, Satan was trying to cause Jesus himself to doubt who he was and what he was here to do. So how does Jesus respond? Don't you know the word of God says that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And then he takes him up on the mountain. And he says, if you're really the son of God, then throw yourself off and angels will catch you. Now, I got to tell you, the first one would have been tempting. I would have been staring at that rock going, man, that's not just bread. That's Italian urban cheese bread. I think I see some grilled cheese coming out of it. <laughs> I'm a visual thinker. The throwing myself off the mountain, no temptation. No, sir. I think I could have passed that test. I'm not positive, but I think I could have passed that test. About the time I got to the edge and everything below the waist goes numb, I would have... No need to prove that to you. I'm confident. <laughs> Had somebody tell me one time, I'm not afraid of falling. I'm just afraid of landing. <laughs> I'm a little nervous about both. So Jesus looks and he says, it is written, do not tempt the Lord your God. See, he had nothing to prove. He had no doubt in him. He knew who he was and what he was sent to do. See, Jesus knew that when he's coming through the wilderness in that 40 days of fasting, he knows that he is about to launch a three and a half year ministry that is going to culminate with the most gruesome, violent death he could succumb to. After service, we'll have a ministry sign up list. <laughs> He knew that what he was there to do for a short window of time was just to lay the blueprint for what was to be carried on because the victory that he was really here to do was of eternal purposes. He understood that he was getting his credentials because there was going to come a day that we were going to be in court and he had to get his credentials to be our defense attorney. So he had this three and a half year Seize it to get his credentials. That's pretty cool. So we have Satan that just tries to bring in doubt. And then we have God who is the judge in this scenario. The word judge, again, means simply to pronounce a sentence. It is to vindicate or to punish depending on the circumstances. We have us, the sinners, in need. In need of a paracletos, in need of an advocate. And we have Jesus, our legal advocate. And when Jesus, we actually celebrate today the culmination of Passion Week. And if you've ever really studied Passion Week, I think that I could probably preach 
six to eight weeks on Passion Week. <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try my best to stay focused so that we are not here through a night service. <laughs> But the Passion Week starts off on Palm Sunday when Jesus comes riding into the city on a donkey. A donkey is a beast of burden. It is a servant's animal and it is represent, a representative of peace. So Jesus comes into the city riding a donkey. This is in Matthew 21. And he comes in and they lay the palm branches down, which is what they did for a king. So he came in as the king of peace into one side of the city. At the very same time, Pontius Pilate came in on animals of war, on, on, on horses, with guards surrounding him from the other side of the city. So simultaneously in the Passion Week, we have Jesus, the King of Peace, the Prince of Peace, being brought into the city to bring a kingdom of peace. And on the other side of the city, we have Pilate who represents man's kingdom. And he's coming in with swords and with spears and a violent army to come in and straighten the city out. And Jesus knows all along what's about to happen. He's got a week to cram in all of this stuff into seven short days. He's got to get his disciples ready to be apostles. Now, with some of them, he may have had some confidence, but he was dealing with Peter. I think Jesus may have been a little concerned for a moment. <laughs> he even told him, he said, Peter... Well, one time he said, this is what's going to happen to me. And Peter says, I won't let it happen to you. He says, get behind me, Satan. You don't know what spirit you're of. <laughs> if I told half y'all that, y'all leave the church. <laughs> Preacher said, I was the devil. A <laughs> little while later, he says, uh, Satan has sought to sift you. But I'm praying for you. And when you return, strengthen your brothers. And Peter, oh, I wouldn't do that. And he says, surely you will. By the time the rooster crows, you will have denied me three times. That's, that's what Jesus had to get ready. His last week, he had to get Peter ready to be an apostle. He had to get the people ready to understand that after it happened, they could look in hindsight and see how his word was fulfilled. He had to give a last warning to the church, to, to the Pharisees, to the religious. He had to clean his house. I love the story when Jesus comes into the temple and they're abusing his house. He flips over the tables of the money changers and he takes a whip and he drives them out of the church. <laughs> You just had an idea, Kathy. <laughs> See, he cleansed his house. He said, you've made my house a den of thieves, but it's supposed to be a house of prayer. All this last week, he was establishing his kingdom and he threw off all the restraints. He said, I've got to hurry and get this done. And then he comes to the last, uh, the last little bit and we, he, he sits down to eat with all his disciples and he says, somebody's going to betray me. And they say, well, who is it? And he says, the same one that dips in this cup. And Judas dips in the cup and he says, go do what you got to do. Oh, amazing. And then he takes him to the garden and he's praying and he says, will you not tarry but yet one hour with me? And then the guards come and they say, hey, Jesus says, who do you seek? And they say, we seek Jesus. And he says, I am he. And boom, they all go out slain. First Pentecostal meeting. <laughs> They're out. And then when they get back up, and they didn't have catchers either, by the way. When they get back up, they come forward. Peter, the man of the hour, takes out his sword. <laughs> Is that not one of the best parts of Scripture? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I heard Perry Stone the other day say, I love people, but there's been a few times I've just asked for God to take care of them. <laughs> I'm going to leave it alone. And then Jesus looks at Peter and says, what are you doing? He picks up the ear, heals the guy that was... <laughs> Can you imagine the viewpoint from that soldier? <laughs> do I arrest him? Do I worship him? Do I just run? I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to retire. <laughs> and then they arrest him. And they take him. 
They beat him, they flog him, they spit on him. They make this crown of thorns, has these huge spikes for thorns, and they press it down in his head until it's piercing into him. They mock him. They call him every name in the book. They mock who he is. They, they actually put the king of, of the Jews on the cross as a sign of mockery, having no idea the irony that they were actually proclaiming the truth. They took a whip that had bones in it and they would whip him and the bones would go into the, to the flesh and would rip out hunks of meat out of his back. You say that's a little graphic. This is some of the problem with the church today. We decided to take out the graphic parts because they're offensive. That's why my, my background is red, because it's the blood of Jesus. You can't take the blood out. If you take the blood out, you might as well take it all out. They beat him. They abused him. They mocked him. They hurt him. And then they made him carry his cross all the way up the hill. And they took him to the top and they put him out and they nailed through his wrist and they nailed through his ankles. They nailed him to a cross and it wasn't standing up. They laid it, laid it down and they nailed him to the cross laying down and then they winched it up and it fell in a hole and it shook and jarred him. That's violent. And he hung there in the sun between two common thieves, the Son of God, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, lay down his throne to accept humanity. He was 100% divine and he was 100% flesh. And he hung on that cross with every ability to stop the process at any given moment. And he chose not to because he says, I'm going to be an advocate. I'm going to defend my people. I'm going to cover my people. And this is the only way to do it. Oh, how amazing. See, John 3, 16 says, for God so loves the world that he gave his only begotten son. And God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But also his son so loved the world that he gave himself. In the garden, he says, I don't want to do this. Made this cup pass from me, but not my will, but your will, Father. Oh, how amazing. So now we, we have who, who Satan is. We have who Jesus is. We have who God is and, and we have who we are. So let's talk about our day in court. I'm going to get to the message in a minute. I'm kidding. For one moment, visualize this court. You've watched the court systems play out on, on TV. Movies. Some of you have been in those rooms. I've been in those rooms. I've watched. I've been a part of proceedings. No, I wasn't charged. Don't look at me like that. <laughs> So, so we have this beautiful, majestic court. This is not the Supreme Court. This is the greatest court. This is the court of heaven. So it makes the Supreme Court look small. And we don't have nine judges. We have God as the one judge, right? So we're in this courtroom. And on this side of the room, if I'm standing looking out from the judge's place, on this side of the room we have a table. Which I didn't put these here for that purpose, but it goes, goes good for example. We have a table on this side. This is the defense's table. And in the defeat of the defendant, in the seat of the defendant, is you. I'll use me for my example. You use your self. And you look around the room and you see this angelic host filling the courtroom to see what happens today. And then in walks this person and he's got this huge briefcase and he walks down the aisle and he comes to the prosecution's table and he puts his briefcase on the table and he opens it up and he has a stack of files. And each file is filled thick with papers. So he takes out one file after another file 
after another file. And occasionally he'll look up at you and go. (laughs) As if to say, I've got you. And then he takes out a legal pad and he puts it down beside him. He puts his briefcase away. He sits down and he begins to go through one folder after another. And he's making notes on his legal pad. And then he'll look up at you and go. <laughs> and then all of a sudden the doors open up again and there in walks someone else and he walks past and it's Jesus. And Jesus comes to the little gate and he opens the gate and he has this little bitty thin folder in his hand with hardly anything in it. And he walks over to your table and he puts his hand on your shoulder and he just gives you this grin as if to say everything's going to be all right. So in your mind, you look and and you see this mount of evidence that has mounted against you. And Jesus has this one little bitty folder and he just smiles at you like it's all okay, son. And then all of a sudden, this huge angel walks in from the back of the, from this part of the courtroom. He walks in, and it's Michael, the archangel. Y'all are seeing this, aren't you? And he says, all rise. The honorable creator of the heavens and the earth. The one we call heavenly father. Almighty God presiding today. You may be seated. Oh, that's awesome. And then God says, what do we have on the docket today? And Satan, or Ha Satan, the prosecutor, he stands up and he says, Your honor, almighty God, we are bringing charges today against one Justin Akers, this man right here in this court today. And we are charging him and we are asking for an immediate decision of guilt with a sentence of death to be carried out immediately. That's serious. So you hear the words ring out and and, and it is the the terror, the, the reality that you're sitting in the seat of the judged. And then he begins to list the charges. Your Honor, on such and such day, Justin, that man right here in this court, did such and such, and such and such, and such and such. Some of y'all's list is going to be longer than others. (laughs) Just, Just being real. There's going to be some that come in and and Satan's going to have like this little bitty folder and the rest of them may be blank papers, you know. And then some of them are going to be like, bring in the rest. (laughs) Just saying. So, So Satan, he begins to go list after list after list after list. And here's the bad part. Every time he releases an accusation, every time he lists a crime, in your mind, what do you say? Oh, I did that one. I'm guilty. I did that. Guess what? There's no plea bargains in the, in the, in the, in the, in the courts of heaven. There's no lesser sentences. There's no purgatory pleas. Don't mean to challenge your theology. It doesn't work like that in the courts of heaven. It's an innocent or a guilty. So as he releases these words, you know you are guilty. And it's like brick after brick, weight after weight falling on you. And then he says, your honor, this concludes the long list of charges against Mr. Akers. So we move for an immediate decision and an immediate sentencing. And Jesus looks up and he says, objection, father. God looks and says, on what grounds? So Jesus stands up and he walks to the middle of the court and he says, oh, Father, we do not deny that these crimes have been committed. As a matter of fact, we don't deny that Justin Akers committed these crimes. Matter of fact, we are here to confirm the accuracy of the charges that have been levied against him this day. 
Not the way you think your defense would go. He says, however, your honor, we must move for an immediate dismissal, the dropping of all charges and the restitution of everything that was lost because this Justin Akers is not the Justin Akers that committed these crimes. And God says, what evidence do you have? And Jesus goes over to his little bitty folder and he opens it up and he says, your honor, may I present to you photographic evidence. This is me, your honor, in the garden praying with my disciples. This is me, your honor, being arrested for the crimes of humanity. This is me, your honor, being mocked and accused and beaten and spat upon. Oh, your honor, heavenly father, this is me being whipped. Your honor, this is me being drugged through the cities, forced to carry my own cross when my physical body had nothing left. Your honor, this is me hanging on a cross between two common thieves. Father, this is the audio recording of me crying out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, as I hung on the cross. Your honor, this is me, my dead body being removed from the cross after my body gave up. This is me being took into a tomb and this is the stone that was placed over my tomb. I move today that the sentence for these crimes has already been paid. And Satan says, objection. How can this be you in the court today if you died? And he says, oh, I'm so glad you asked. May I submit exhibit R, resurrection. <laughs> This is the tomb that was empty and this is me standing beside it. And this is the angel that we have in the court today that rolled the stone away. He can verify the accounts to be true. So your father, heavenly father, your honor, I move for the immediate dismissal because these crimes have been paid for. But God, I have more evidence because here's a photo of Justin. Well, defense attorney, why is it all red? Because he's under my blood. So your honor today, we don't plead the fifth amendment. We don't plead the second amendment. We don't plead the first amendment. We plead a blood covenant. And I say today that this man, we got the DNA results back and the DNA collected from the crime scenes does not match the DNA of this man in the court today because he has a new DNA. He has a new mind in Christ. He is a new creation and the old man is dead. Ooh, ooh, ooh. It's not over. And then God takes his gavel because the angels are erupting in praise and Satan is screaming in defeat. And God takes his gavel and he beats the desk and he says, order, order in my court. And he says, this case is dismissed. All charges are dropped immediately and there will be a full restitution paid in double that's what Exodus says. That's what Leviticus says. That's what Jeremiah says. That's what Job says. That's what Isaiah says. Paid in double, full restitution for what has been lost or confiscated because of this malicious prosecution. Ooh. Ooh. See, we have an advocate with the Father. But the story's not over. But my throat was. <laughs> Jesus comes over because you're still in a state of shock. He comes over and he puts his hand on your, on your shoulder and he sits down beside you. 
And he smiles. He says, I told you everything was okay. He said, but I want you to understand some things. You've been forgiven in this court today. But I'm going to give you a badge. Because, see, the judge comes out in the courtroom and he will say things to the public. But in his private chambers, he carries on conversations that he doesn't have in public. So I'm going to give you a badge that you can go under my name and my authority into the chambers of the judge. And you can have one-on-one -on -one conversations. Is that not what scripture says? When Jesus was on the cross, the ground began to shake and the clouds began to swirl. And the veil in the temple was rent. So Jesus says, you now have access to the judge at any time you want. Ooh. And he says, that's not all. He says, we have a court appointed advocate and his name is Holy Spirit. And he's not just going to be with you. He's going to reside inside of you. So when you are weak. He will be strength to your mortal body and to your spiritual being. Romans 8. He says, when you are weak, he will give you strength. And then he says, oh, but Justin, not only have you been sinful, but son, you have a sin nature. I didn't come to pay the price just for the forgiveness of your sins. I came to give you liberty from the sin nature. So the Holy Spirit is going to quicken you and he will give you the strength to overcome what you cannot overcome. And then all of a sudden, Jesus looks up at the bailiff and he says, Bailiff, take these shackles off. This man is innocent. And he looks at you and he says, from now on, you don't have to be bound in shackles and chains. You are a free man. You are a free woman. Oh, how awesome. 